Hello colleagues, um, ladies and gentlemen, it's a pleasure to uh, be able to share with you some insights on the topic of transnational terrorism from Al-Qaeda to the Islamic State. I'm sorry I could not be with you, uh, but this module, this, so this is taped, and the idea that uh, we have is that this is able to help you through your discussions as such. So let me start by explaining a little bit what uh, the topic is going to be about. The topic of transnational terrorism itself and the emphasis is fundamentally on the question of transnationality, the evolution of a type of terrorism that has mutated in recent years into a new age, is the topic at hand. But to understand fundamentally that age, that new phase, we have nonetheless to take a step back a little bit and examine where does the question of terrorism, as it had been so much bandied about in contemporary international affairs, where does it fit in that continuum of questions of security, how we can understand it, map it, understand its landscape, and of course, see what can be done about it. So I start essentially with an understanding that this is a question that is at the heart of international affairs. As you can see in this visual here, this type of current affairs type of coverage is something that has been with us, the professional, the larger society, the observer, and of course the media, has been with us for intensively for quite a while, let's say some 15 years or so, 20 years, uh, if we go a little bit beyond 9-11. But that type of coverage is also arresting. What are we looking at? We see a couple of elements referring to groups, to countries, to technologies, to individuals. And that is something that, as a sum total, as you can see in this visual, is constitutive of a face of terror, and a new face of terror at that. So this is interesting, because that type of coverage speaks of a centrality of a question that we carry and therefore have to address. The second element that we see, of course, is that the question of terrorism itself is fundamentally a policy question at the highest levels. Here's an example, a summit that took place in 2015, um, the so-called Countering Violent Extremism uh, Summit. More recently, the same um, issue has been referred to as preventing violent extremism. But what's important here is that the term, the concept of terrorism itself is around the issues. It's something that we play with in terms of the terminology with always, or rather approach, with always a sense of uncertainty, a vagueness. Um, there's a sense of an incomplete concept. And that is interesting, secondly, because as we just seen, if it is such a central concept, if it is such a central issue, then we should not carry such vagueness as such. But that is the case. And that is the case even more so, as we can see with, as I said earlier, the larger media coverage. Here's an example. This week in global terror, a certain normality of a phrase that should be really associated with other types of news, financial news, the arts, uh, sports, whatnot. And here, yet, in a newspaper of the daily type, it refers to, in a sense, even of a very interesting normality to events that are taking place around the world that it belong to the world of terrorism. So my point here is that we have seen this issue of violence becoming front and center in our lives, pop magazines, as you can see here, covering the uh, uh, face of a terrorist as such, becoming so central that we essentially have been inhabiting a real world and a policy world that is surrounded by that question as such. But that is not enough. What we need to do is go towards this, as you just saw, which is to go to from the media coverage, good or bad, that's what it is. It's a different exercise. It's a journalistic exercise. But the professional, the professional in the making, the analyst, the scholar, the one that needs to develop tools to function and understanding, needs to look at that type of work. What is essentially the issue about? And as we can see, we have any number of dimensions that have to be addressed. The question of understanding. What do they want? What is it about? Something about the causality, the, the so-called question of motivation as such. What type of profile does it take? You see essentially different types of groups, from the lone individual type, the so-called lone wolves, to right, left-wing, 
ideology, religiously driven types of groups, a multiplicity of issues. And of course, a question we we'll, will tackle, which is the question of the type of violence that is projected almost on a mode of war, of conflict, of a certain militarization, as I have called it. So this is essentially what we need to do, and this is what I'd like to look at with at you. First, we'll look at the questions of the concepts. It's very important that we be able to address essentially what is the question of the conceptual basis of these questions. Second, we'll look at the context, what has been happening, where are essentially fundamentally the components today, transnationality as we've seen, but a little bit more complex. Who inhabits that new scene? And then we'll turn to finish on the questions of regulation challenges, essentially what to do about this. So without further ado, let's go into the question of the conceptual issues on two angles, the definition and the history. Here, it is very important to start with trying to make sense of what terrorism is about. You see, this is one of the most difficult notions out there. Difficult objectively, not merely as a matter of dispute. There is dispute. But it's mostly important to understand that the issue is marred by a conceptual deficit, as I call it. It's almost as if the concept is stuck at some 80% download and is not moving forward. The reason for that is that it is a challenging notion. And why is that? It is a challenging notion because it has been deformed by the rhetorical usage of it. In other words, terrorism is a term of delegitimation, is a term that is projected to take away from an actor, state, non-state, individual, group, whatnot, essentially a sense of legitimacy by virtue of the action that they have chosen to undertake, undertake the resort to violence towards the indiscriminate. But that has been so used over the ages that it has essentially been captured mostly by its pejorative use as opposed to its scientific. Now, the qualification is not meant to justify or to explain to move in that direction, but it's fundamentally to understand, to make sense of in a clinical sense. And I submit to you, we have been lag missing on that. We have been missing a dispassionate, clinical, professional understanding of a concept that is so inhabited by the rhetorical usage of it, the emotional usage of it, understandable, of course, because of the crime, but that does not apply in other fields where we deal with criminality or with other types of even conflict and war with a certain distance. And here the issue has been confusing our understanding. So we have an imperative of a value-free clinical understanding of what terrorism is, as I said, primarily because it is so central in our lives in the early 21st century. Examples of confusion abound. Is it terrorism or not? We see this all the time. Here are examples an attack in the United States a few years ago, simultaneously one in France, and two leading authorities that are in charge of combating terrorism, unclear. On the one hand, an event is where killing has happened indiscriminately, is referred to at the highest level as not terrorism, and on the other hand, an individual, essentially in a corporate killing setting, is referred to as terrorism. As it turns out, a week later, these two examples were switched, and one what became no longer referred to as terrorism, the France one, and the one in the US became referred to as terrorism. How can it be that we have so much confusion? Uh, another period of time where we see a standoff, where a group of people take control of a part of a terror, use violence, behave terroristically, and yet there's plenty of confusion. Some think it's terrorism, others not. There's a debate, and of course, at the heart of this, as you can see, there comes the phrase that is always present in this discussion, your terrorist is my freedom fighter. Your terrorist is my freedom fighter. Time and again, age over age, generation after generation, we come back to a problem of subjectivity. And that is another difficulty, as I said, because if we are to have a clinical understanding, we should not be beholden to subjective understandings. We might have disputes about the motivations, the qualifications, but once established the facts, clinically, as I said, and I emphasis, place emphasis on that term, it should be a, a possibility for us to label that. But yet, the labeling is problematic, as we can see. So we have difficulties in addressing that.
We have difficulties because, as you can see, terrorism, thirdly, is also an evolving, changing phenomenon. The terrorism of today is not necessarily the terrorism of yesterday, and yet it is the same type of violence being projected. In other words, we refer today, essentially, when we think of terrorists, essentially as Islamists. This is what comes to mind for most people. The leading groups, Al-Qaeda in the 2000s, the Islamic State in the 2010s, are dominating the news. Although there's plenty of other groups, and that's another issue we'll come back to. But yet today, and therefore rather, when we speak of terrorism, when a, the average policymaker, the average citizen, thinks of terrorism, they think in terms of the Islamists. And of course, sometimes they go beyond that and commit mistakes in thinking culturally as Islam. And that is, of course, an insult and a mistake made in relation to that. But the problem is the following. If you contextualize that history and you travel back in time and you find yourself in the 1970s and ask a passerby what is and who is a terrorist, the answer will not be Islamist. Islamism, at the time, doesn't mean anything. And there's plenty of trouble already in the Middle East and uh, as such. But the reference will be to a young, left-wing, radical, Western European terrorist. Baro Meinhof, Red Brigades, Action Direct, Communist uh, Revolutionary Cells of Belgium, on and on and on. A jihadi doesn't mean anything at the time. Earlier, at another age, you would have even the same thing. In a century ago, for instance, you would have the reference in uh, uh, a, a, a passerby asked about what is a terrorism in the 1880s, for instance, would answer what? A Russian revolutionary or a nihilist, a left-wing Western European terrorist, doesn't mean anything. So we see that it changes from one age to the other, and yet, well, you have these cycles, and yet it has the commonality that we need to tap in, to unearth, to understand. And this is important because the emphasis today is essentially on one type of terrorism, and that is not essentially um, satisfactory. So the answer to what is terrorism? Essentially, all of the above. All of the above, as you can see in this list. Most undeniably, it is a social phenomenon. Quite obviously, it is a crime. The killing of the non-combatant, notice that I said non-combatant, not the innocent, which is a politically loaded term, the non-combatant, the civilian, which opens the possibility of a legal qualification as such. Obviously, it can be a strategy for a large campaign, a tactic for specific operations, and a technique for a type of attack itself. So, multi-tiered levels, usually, but not only, resorted by the weak against the strong. We speak of non-state actors as the mostly important types of actors, armed groups, but state terrorism has existed, exists as a measure of a concept. In fact, if we understand terrorism as a means to an end, then quite obviously it can be resorted to by any such actor and we need therefore to qualify the means, the activity itself as such. And most interestingly, terrorism has this very interesting two-step approach. It is both a psychological and a physical weapon. In other words, you have the moment of the explosion, the T time, as I explained, the T event, the explosion, the killing, the kidnapping, and then most importantly is the aftermath. What comes after? The fear, the panic, the pressure on a society, the pressure on a government to pursue this course of action or that. And it's this combination of a two-step approach that is defining of terrorism. Again, something we don't necessarily find in other types of violence. And most importantly, terrorism is an international issue. We think today of Islamists, the Middle East, Arabs, mistake, big mistake, cultural mistake in relation to that. Yes, the dominant groups today are undeniably from that region and from that ideology, but that is not the issue itself. Wherever you go, wherever you look throughout history, most countries, if not all, have had one form or another of a terrorism issue. And every one of these groups, of course, is subject to the very same principle we established a moment ago, which is the subjectivity principle. Your terrorist is my freedom fighter. So there will be disagreement. That group does not belong. That group should not be on the list. We regard them as national heroes. We regard them as combatants. That is irrelevant. 
The point is that the question of terrorism was at some point debated in most of these societies and came to mark a moment as such. Which means that we have to think in terms of a problem, in terms of the cycles, of the phases. We are at a high time today in the 2010s, but I can assure you that the discussion on terrorism was as intense, if not more intense, in the 1970s as another big era where things were happening. And in fact, when we look at that, we see that the question of definition is therefore only one piece of the puzzle. Here's the United Nations General Assembly. Note that it is the GA, not the Security Council, which brings a measure of authority which is lacking here, telling us that in this long, convoluted, UNE's type of definition, what is interesting about it is that in any circumstances, whatever that action is meant to project as a consideration of a political, philosophical, ideological, racial, ethnic, religious, or any other nature, in a sense, everything, is irrelevant, unacceptable. The unacceptability of it is the key mark. And of course, this is a difficult proposition because precisely the terrorist wants to be heard. He wants to communicate a message. A terrorist that, that conducts an attack somewhere in the back of the woods that no one knows about is actually not doing what he considers as his or her mission fundamentally, which is to communicate. And by the way, this opens the question of the media in relation to this. And so in effect, when we start to gather this, because the question of the definition is one problem, but I submit to you is not an insurmountable problem. We shouldn't be beholden to that. It is difficult, and there will be dispute, and we may not have an internationally accepted consensual definition, but so be it. That is only one of the difficulties for the professional, for the operational professional, more importantly, but even so, for the policymaker and the larger population, it should only be understood as such, and then we need to move towards the other issues. Particularly since I submit to you, we can have a few components. Let's look at them. The terrorism has to be, if it is going to be terrorism as such and not something else, it has to be understood as something that is organized, deliberate, systematic, repeated. It's not one-off type of activities. Political, which is of course everything, but it is politically motivated. That is key as such. Usage of force, violence, however you want to qualify it, but that projection, that illegitimate projection, of course, indiscriminately targeting civilians, and that is the heart of it. If anything, terrorism lies in this very notion. It is the indiscriminate killing of the non-combatant. That is its qualifier as such. Along other things, of course, as I mentioned, sending a message, cultural, ideological, religious, whatnot, aimed at a symbol, a, the World Trade Center, symbol of the economic might of the United States, mosques, church, temples being attacked as such fundamentally, state or non-state actor, it could be a combination of any one of those, part of a campaign, as I said, fundamentally and meant to achieve a strategic result, which, of course, connect with its political nature. So here you have it. Terrorism is essentially this, a violent and lawful act or set of actions conducted illegitimately, it's very important to highlight the illegality of it, or seriously threatened to be conducted indiscriminately by an individual, a group, or a state against a non-combatant population or property with a view to further the advancement of a political, religious, or ideological goal by creating a psychological climate of fear beyond the physical limitations of the original act of force. So terrorism can be understood as such. Now let's take a look at the history of terrorism. If that is the definition, where has terrorism been coming from? There's essentially a much longer and deeper history where we have episodes going back as the early 60s in Palestine where the Jewish group, the Zealots, were conducting operations organized, systematic against the Roman occupier with a view to force them, to compel them to leave the territory. And that, in many ways, already have the features that we have seen. Then we have the the so-called assassins, the Hashashiyin in the mountains of Persia and uh, in the 10th and 13th century, which were conducting similarly, uh, criminally for that matter, motivated operations to scare off the Sultan or the authority around the region so that they can establish a dominion through the projection of terror, the terrorizing of a whole large scale areas. 
And very interestingly and quite paradoxically, we owe the very term la terreur, uh, terrorism to la terreur, which is, of course, in 1793, the terrorizing of the non-revolutionaries in France as such. Very interesting episode where those sitting in the state were terrorizing and killing, for that matter, large numbers, 20,000 or so were, by some accounts, if not beyond, uh, a very violent affair, the, the, those opposed to them in the name of an ideology, which, interestingly, for that matter, was about liberty, freedom, and equality as such. And then, but most importantly, we enter the age of terrorism, as I said earlier, in the 19th century with the anarchists and the nihilists, and then we have the decolonization campaigns. This is your essentially classical, easiest, I feel like saying, type of terrorism where national movements, whether in Cyprus and Palestine and Algeria, choose to resort to violence, in South Africa a little bit later, choose to resort to violence to essentially terrorize the occupier, the colonialist, to move away and leave the land. And in some cases, it worked. Algeria as an example. See the Battle of Algiers as an excellent illustration of that, the, 1950, uh, the 1966 uh, Gilo Ponte Corvo film about that. Uh, and then, of course, most importantly, we enter the modern type of era with the so-called 1970s political extremism. That is a very, very important decade, ladies and gentlemen, as important as the current phase. See how packed it is with the groups active. Most of them, of course, of one dominant left-wing ideology, as you can see from the star, uh, and most of them essentially located in Western Europe. The German group, uh, the Red Army faction, also known as Bader Meinhof, is the leading one with all kinds of connections around that. Of course, the Italian, of course, Red Brigades uh, and other groups uh, in relation to that. With a number, of course, of Latin American individual activists, there are some groups in Uruguay as well, but essentially Carlos Elias uh, Ramirez Sanchez, who becomes known as Carlos the Jackal, who is a bit of the poster child of terrorism of the 1970s, conducting many operations operations. A decade packed, packed with activities that we have tended to forget and have international qualifications as such. But for all of its intensity, quantity, impact, nascent internationalism, 1970s terrorism was not yet what the 1990s transnational terrorism will become, which is essentially the displacement, the transnational dimension. And here we enter into the realm of what Al-Qaeda, the group that was founded in the summer of 1989 by Osama bin Laden in Afghanistan, and projects itself with a different rerouting of its movement, becomes a different ballgame. Now at that point, we have to understand what Al-Qaeda, whose importance has to be really emphasized, is not so much because of all of the noise that is being made by those fighting or opposed or governments, which is that dimension. But the professional, the analyst, has to understand what Al-Qaeda revolutionizes in its modus operandi, which is the displacement, the so-called movement from here to there, what they call in their own writing, min al-adul qarib ila al-adul ba'id, from the near to the far enemy. And that phrase, which they aptly coin, essentially captures what transnationality, transnationalism, the movement, the projection is about which opens a whole new moment of history. But I submit to you that is also impactful and possible because it is simultaneous with what? Globalization. In other words, Al-Qaeda does what it wants to do. It projects, it is its ambition, it's its battle plan, but it is able to succeed because this is coterminous and happening at the same time that globalization is being born. And this combination of the two is what essentially is the qualifier of a new age in which we still are in the 2010s, late 2010s, as essentially transnational terrorism. So this was the first pillar of our discussion, what terrorism is about. It suffers a conceptual deficit. The, def the, the definition is complex and has go through different ages. Today we find ourselves in relation to this transnational terrorism. But to understand what transnational terrorism is about, we need to reroute the discussion a little bit and go into the current environment which tell us something which we would not necessarily have expected, which is the arrival of the martiality of terrorism, what I call the militarization of terrorism. 
which is essentially the product of Al-Qaeda, but has by now gone beyond. Now, to understand this, we have to understand the conflict, war, armed conflict, uh, warfare. War, to simplify matters, goes through ages. And today, it is a very complex moment for war, as you can see, which can even be used as a fact and an argument, as David Kennedy writes about this. And we find ourselves in this moment where there's a lot of uncertainty among military affairs, among strategic affairs, policy-wise. What will the new wars look like? Strategically, where is it heading? And that question is, if you followed, essentially at the heart of the question of terrorism. On the one hand, we have essentially the territorial aspect of it. Territorial in an age of globalization, as you can see. And so this physicality that is gradually disappearing, not completely gone. Think about places like Ukraine. Think about some conflicts such as in the Yemen and elsewhere. It is still very much present. But yet, at the same time, we have all of this high-tech, this re codification, in fact, of war, where drone warfare, where the technology makes it completely, essentially, a software issue, where projection violence from some headquarters in Ohio to some hill up in Pakistan is essentially warfare happening simultaneously in situation rooms, as they call them. And this borders, at the heart of it, we find what? The new groups, Al-Qaeda, the Islamic State, all of the groups that will follow 50, 60 years from now, we will have even other types of generations. But that is essentially the hybridity in the making that the groups have. Here is the scene that they inhabit. Essentially, a hybrid type of warfare, a re-understanding, remapping, a future of violence that is very much unclear, questions of global health, environment, weaponization of civilian assets will come more and more at the heart of this discussion. And that is what we need to understand to make sense of that. So where is it coming from? Well, as you know very well, we have ages going through warfare. They are essentially based on a certain symmetry. This is conceptualized in the writings of Weber, von Clausewitz, and of course Rousseau. You have a sense of symmetry of a here and now. This concept, best encapsulated, let's say, in Napoleon um, campaign in Russia, as the painting here has, a moment. If we were to systematize this, we would get something where, in fact, it is simply a moment, a first age, or a second age in this case, which has gone through an evolution. An evolution that is accelerated from ages to ages, and we get, by the 1950s, already in the 1950s, which is quite a long time ago already, into the logic of the so-called network-centric warfare. So if conflict go through ages, from the static episode to the projection, this is the second age, basically trench warfare, World War I, to the third age, which is about movement, German blitzkrieg, and US uh, Air Force and British Navy to the 1950s where the guerrillas in Latin America and in Indochina and elsewhere parts of Asia as well, the Vietnam obviously opens this sense of asymmetrical warfare which we also find in Southern Africa in parts of these conflicts. And you get into a gradual recodification of what conflict is about. Now, if that is happening, then most certainly what we're looking at is a type of paradigm that is changed. This is the original conflict paradigm, a here and now. A specific moment and place, an encounter, and a sharply etched sequential time frame. Beginning and predictability. That is essentially gone or going, 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 and being replaced as you can see patterns of war shifting here with a platoon in Baghdad in 2006-07, you get a sense of three concepts that are at the heart of the new conflict. Civilianization, privatization, and politicization. Those are the new boundaries of what conflict is about. And that, if you were to systematize it as we had earlier, gives you a completely turned around concept where the space and the time are completely different. Space is enlarged. There's a certain geographical indeterminacy and time is completely fluid, open, accelerated and decelerated at will. And that is the space that the new terrorists inhabit. And that space is borrowed not from civilian affairs, 
but captured from military affairs. And this is where we are. The context of the new conflict, and therefore, if you follow the new terrorism, comes from this notion of transnationalism, which Mary Caldor writes about in the 1990s, innumerable transnational connections from above and beyond in a context of the destatization and the weakness of the state, generally in parts of the global south as a result of conflict, in the global north as a result of the pressure of capital and media, but the state is being in the so-called defensive mode, in the retreat. It may make a comeback, oftentimes in the guise of authoritarianism, we've seen this in a number of places around the world, but most importantly, that space is a space which is increasingly inhabited by the group, the armed groups. And here's Liang Yang Shui, our Chinese military strategist in their 1989 book on restricted warfare, essentially capturing very neatly that what is happening, which is contrary to tradition, is exceeding the frequent, frequency bandwidths of our understanding. We think here, the issues are here. That is very important in relation to terrorism. It's a lot of cliches. There's a lot of tired imagery about the terrorism discussion today. And we need to go beyond that. Simply talking about these groups or that ideology will not do the trick today in the late 2010s. We need to go beyond, and that means understanding, I submit to you, the modus operandi of a certain transnationalization and militarization of terrorism. That's what the new terrorism is about in one word. So let's explore what we see, and then of course we have it here. It becomes a reality. The new war, the new terrorism, becomes a commodity. A phone, an iPhone, that we could use with apps, essentially, to conduct warfare. And that's precisely what happened as early as March 2004 in Spain, in the attack in the train station, Atosha, which is exactly that, a backpack, an iPhone, and a Gmail account. Three things that could be obtained within minutes in any part of the world today. And that is something that is enabling the new terrorist to act in this way. So, to finish on the second pillar, we have seen, if you would, fundamentally, that the predictable, distinguished, concentrated, brief, in one word, linear type of conflict has been replaced by what we see as privatized, indifferentiated, dispersed, open-ended, and in one word, non-linear type of conflict, and therefore, non-linear type of terroristic engagement. And it's in that sense that we have to understand the new terrorism as new wars. Not in a policy phrase such as the global war on terror, which is the prerogative of an administration, the Bush administration for that matter, and that's fine, but new wars as fundamentally a militariz militarized asset, the weaponization of civilian assets. The plane, not as a place of kidnapping, hijacking, making demands, but the plane as a missile. And that is the revolution that was introduced. So let's turn to the second and last two sections. Who, therefore, inhabits this uh, sector? Who are the actors of it? Well, again, as we said, fundamentally, this is a big and increasingly important question. Understanding the new types of groups, a new generation of group, is very important. And where is this heading? And questions abound all the time. We need to update our matrix. Now, this essentially is the past. This is the past. These are groups are extremely important. I highlighted their importance earlier. We have to keep our matrix updated backwards to make sense of what they were doing. But they were, con con they were concerned with the here and now. They were concerned with a state they wanted to punish, replace, capture. But they were not necessarily going beyond that, as we've seen. That is the new reality. Transnationalization? globalization, destatization, essentially deterritorialization, essentially an open-ended and constant opening which is extremely difficult for the professional because where do you prioritize, which attention do you pay to and how to move in relation to this. Fifteen years later, as you can see, just looking at Africa as an example, but we could have had other uh, regions, but this is essentially where most of the made their mark, most of the conflicts, as you can see, and there's a lot of killing, are at the hands of four different, five different groups that are all offshoots of Al-Qaeda itself, as an example. So the non-state terroristic actor has gained potency, power, 
on the global scene as a result of that militarization, as I argue to you. A militarization that is constantly present and centered. You see, we speak a lot, many experts will tell you about the Khalifat or the religious phraseology of that group and they want to do this and they want to convert and that. Yes, most of these groups are undeniably religiously driven, essentially, and we should fundamentally remind ourselves, for those not familiar, as a way of manipulating, disturbing, instrumentalizing a religion. Let's be clear about that. But that's not my point. I think that's a given. What is really important is that we see that at the heart of these groups, the religious phraseology is the veneer, is the superficial clothing of that. At the heart of it, you find things like this. This is an excerpt that speaks much more in the mode almost of a military manual, imbalance of power, fast-moving light forces, conventional fighting, armed military forces, destroying the foundations infrastructure of the enemy, Sun Tzu or Osama bin Laden circa 1996. 1996, five good years before 9-11. The terrorist group are always one step ahead. The state is catching up. The society is observing. The media is reporting after the fact. It's very important to show some modesty in our understanding of these groups and not demonstrate so clearly that we control the narrative. Particularly when, as you can see, 9-11, which is the biggest operation in history, not just in our time, comes as the culmination of a process, not the beginning, as often is said, 9-11 changed everything. Yes, in terms of policy making, but 9-11 was the culmination of something that started a good decade before in terms of the preparation as such, as you can see. And the modus operandi is fundamental here. And what better example of a globalized event than 9-11 itself, which is designed in Kuala Lumpur, supervised from Host, planned in Hamburg, rehearsed in Tarragona, and launched on the east coast of the United States in two hours with less than 20 individuals involved in fundamentally revolutionizing our mode of understanding and of course beamed internationally because once the first plane hit, all the TVs were on, all the channels were covering and of course the second plane, its plane hits live, impacting the mind, going back to our definition, the T moment and the aftermath that comes. So this is the past. This organization of conflict that is so neatly organized, the so-called Trinitarian organization, state, military, and society, has been increasingly replaced by state facing an armed group, which has a franchise, which continues to do all of those attacks, has an uncertain relationship with its own constituency, which it doesn't represent uh, accountability. Some might support it, some might be the target of it, but that is fast evolving. We see that that gives us groups, franchises, spin-offs, Al-Qaeda, which gives you um, Al-Qaeda and the Islamic Maghreb, which gives you something called the Mujaw, Al-Qaeda, which influences Boko Haram, which influences something called Ansaru, on and on and on, constantly, a constant unpacking, which is a feature of what? Globalization, middle management as such. The diffusion of that, what I call the McDonaldization, as in McDonald's, of terrorism. That commodification is a sign of our times. And that's what we have to understand. Not so much the talk about the Khalifat and the design. That's grandstanding. That's almost fu fundamentally, dare I say it, irrelevant. What is fundamentally irrelevant is the projection, the mode, and that militarization. And you can see it here when you compare ages. This is the Munich so-called infamous picture with the Black September hijacker in, in September 5th, 1972. And if you compare this type of activity, this control, which in fact this gentleman is supposed to be in control of the operation, he's hiding, uh, for, uh, he's rather uh, controlling, hijacking, uh, kidnapping the Israeli athletes, and he's supposed to be in control of the operation. But everything in that operation ended up being improvised. And everything in this image, the body language itself, the vis visuals of it, speaks of a certain defensive, what I call here, asymmetry. Compare this, if you would, with the so-called offensive asymmetry that is much more um, assertive that we see with the 9-11 operation. This is the first commando on the South Tower that essentially becomes much more planning, going into um, connecting planes two hours earlier in smaller airports to evade detection, planning almost in a military style, as you can see here, even from the, the determination that we see, and which, of course, is unpacked time and time. 9-11, 7-7, 7, 7, 
constantly within this logic where we see this repeated and, and uh, engendering the so-called children of Al-Qaeda. Here's the Tsarnaevs, and here's, we've become familiar with this imagery of planning of a certain executive order phase dimension, as I call it. And that professionalization, which started and was demoed by Al-Qaeda, ended up coming back time again as we see that. And of course, lest you think that all this terrorism, even today, is Islamist, here's Anders Breivik, who goes on to kill 77 people after attacking the Ministry of Defense of his own uh, uh, government in, uh, in uh, Oslo. And what does we see here fundamentally is that you see the same logic. Militarization, dressing as special forces, writing about this, visiting this, in the name of what? Islamophobia. Westernophobia, Islamophobia is secondary. What is primary in transnational terrorism is the modus operandi. And that form of violent extremism, that term of radicalization, borrows fundamentally from a certain age. Of course, Al-Qaeda, as I said, is at the start of this. They revolutionize. They don't even innovate. They literally revolutionize the mode. But Al-Qaeda has gone through a sequence which is actually very interesting to follow and understand. It's relatively straightforward. Age one, it's a very hierarchical mode. CEO, deputy, councils, groups, essentially organized in that as it launches its battle mode. After the uh, invasion of Afghanistan, as the United States react to 9-11, it does something very innovative. Instead of fighting in that mode, it disseminates. Sun Tzu, again, spreading the enemy, attention of the enemy. It really very militarized in those lessons. Machiavelli even comes to mind. And it becomes much more dispersed, elusive, evanescent, difficult to, to handle. Remember the debate at the time, does it even exist? Where is it? It becomes a constellation, is the term used as such. And at the heart of it, you have what I call Al-Qaeda Al-Um, which in Arabic means the mother Al-Qaeda, the headquarters, to make it quick. And around that, a number of franchises. Of course, the first to be really big is the North African one, Al-Qaeda and the Islamic Maghreb. And then, of course, you have Al-Qaeda and the Arabian Peninsula, which becomes really big in 2009, 2010. And then gradually, we move to the arrival of another franchise, of course, which is the one in Iraq. And as you can see, slowly in the 2010s, AQ becomes less and less relevant in the center, and the franchises gain power. And we move essentially from that whole history that they have gone through 20 long years, which is very long. By terrorism standards, five, six, seven years is a lot of time for pressuring a campaign of sorts. In the 1970s, they lasted no more than that, fundamentally. Uh, but a Meinhof's real, really kind of golden age is 71 to 73, and that's essentially it. Afterwards, the, the leaders are in jail, and those that follow them start making operations that are less and less impactful. But as you can see here, from the development to its planning to 9-11 retreating to the speeches that Bin Laden sends in 04, 05, or 06, and then afterwards, from 07 onwards, it's become much more involved in the fusion. And then you see that the impact of that group on contemporary transnational terrorism is, on the one hand, groups that are formed on it, part of it, and others that are influenced in terms of that. And this is when things become interesting. And then something happens. And then something happens. Traffic that was going towards Al-Qaeda, Al-Um, the mother organization, once bin Laden disappears and the Wahiri takes over, starts gradually going towards that now recognizable black flag. And you see something interesting, which is that fundamentally, a franchise of a group starts displacing it and gradually taking over that central entity. They don't exist separately as in competition. They gradually displace and make the other one irrelevant. You could think of what the Islamic State does is, in effect, a coup on Al-Qaeda. And this is when we get to the Islamic State. So what is the Islamic State? Ontologically, fundamentally, what, how to conceptualize it? Well, you could look at the narrative historically of what it is. Al-Qaeda gives birth to the franchises. Al-Qaeda in uh, uh, Iraq, okay, the, um, in Mesopotamia, the land of the two rivers, Iraq initially, then becomes Al-Qaeda in Iraq after the death of its first leader, which is Al-Zarqawi in 06, and then gradually becomes the Islamic State in Iraq and Syria 2013, the Islamic State, full stop, in June 29, 2014. That's the narrative that we have. The expert that I speak, spoke about, 
But the professional has to look around that, as you can see, the historical undergrounding, that they make reference to that themselves, the so-called one-century history in the region, the passage from the post-colonial to the post-globalization, which is in the mind of all of these actors, particularly those coming from the West, as we can see, the weakening of the state in the context of the re-empowerment or newly empowered state or self-empowered non-state actors, the passage from this long transition, post-Cold War, post-9-11, post-Arab Spring, all of that is a moment of flux in international affairs. And of course, the new wars giving us the transnational ties. So to understand the Islamic State, I submit to you, we have to embrace the fact that it is a multifaceted multi-layered entity. It has different levels of analysis that we can work with. On the one hand, it has its own history, which as you can see, goes back in its earlier incarnation as early as 1999. More formally, when it becomes, of course, when uh, Abu Mas'ab al-Zarqawi creates his own entity and sells it to Al-Qaeda that he represents in Iraq. Once the United States invade Iraq and the mess starts, it gives him a chance to actually develop exactly what Al-Qaeda was doing in Afghanistan, except he's doing it in Iraq, in the presence of US soldiers. And from there on, when he's killed uh, by a drone in June 2006, immediately, and I mean immediately the very next day, it re kind of reorients itself towards a more Iraqi-centric type of group. And that becomes something interesting that it goes through, slowing down a little bit in 07 because of the so-called surge that the United States conducts, but then gradually as they prepare to leave and as things deteriorate and as Maliki's uh, regime becomes more and more violent and repressive um, and killing a lot of the Sunnis, it gradually builds up an alliance with the tribes in northern and northwestern Iraq to so-called conduct a movement to push back, to recapture, and also benefits from the remnants of the Saddam Hussein uh, military. So you have this Iraqi story. But of course... As I said, we have to understand that the Islamic State is also the result of this. This is a story that is even told by those to part in it as something of a failure. The US invasion of Iraq, mission failed, defeat, marching towards hell, no end in sight. We're losing, monstering, creating people's violence through the torture. All of that is something which the policy maker, North and South, East and West, follow and forget rather too easily. This is front and center. We have to look at this in the eye. The violence of the 2000s is at the heart and at the origin of what ISIS became and the barbarity that we see in those videos has its origin also in that type of element initially. And this is key because the violations when one conducts counterterrorism, can come back to haunt. There is a certain easy acceptance that we need to do nasty things to get result. No. That is a crime, that is a violation. Unless you are, I think, cynical enough to accept that that comes for that, but then if that, the approach, the price to pay is that. I expect some disagreement with that, but I stand firm on it. I think that fundamentally, a way to address terrorism that is firm, solid, result-oriented, can and should do without any violations, and here's the result. Iraq is exhibit A in fundamentally this approach. Thirdly, the Islamic State, as I said, it's multi-layered, is also this, which is completely new. You see, Ben Laden wanted to be transnational, conceptually, but he never really achieved that beyond the Hamburg cell or the operations at a micro level. This is much more of a macro level. This is happening regardless of what the Islamic State wants to do. Yes, it creates the vortex. Yes, it creates the destination. But look how thick these arrows are and how people are coming from all over all over the world, 80 countries by the UN count, 30 to 35,000 people from Chile to China. Chilean of Chilean extractions, Chinese of Chinese extraction. It is a fundamentally revolutionized mode in which these operators, not just individuals, in the 1970s we had adventurers, individuals losing and going uh, essentially to, to, for the fun of it, for, for, for the adventure. Now we have couples, we have families going fundamentally in relation to this. And lastly, rather, is fundamentally this. The most important thing ultimately in the Islamic State's innovation is this. We spoke about communication, and at the heart of this is completely revolutionized. 
high quality HD um, Hollywood style editing that is put online day after day. Qualitatively sophisticated, quantitatively overwhelming things that are happening all the time that are impacting what? The generation of the video games, the generation of the videos, the generation of the MTV style quick fast editing and that's much more impactful than anything else because it takes a life of its own and we see this happening and many of the editors of these videos that you see have violent scenes, combat scenes. You never had a combat scene with Bin Laden. This is filmed in situ with, with editing and dissemination in different languages. That is something that has opened a door of a new nature. And quite logically, their sophistication gets the results. Here's the hacking in, 20, in January 2015 of uh, the US Central Command. Um, and of course, we get to the last element, which is the following. And this is a bit of a conundrum, because if you, thought, if you followed the argument, we've had a transnationalizing terrorism over the ages, Al-Qaeda. But now, with what the Islamic State did in Mosul as its Iraqi capital, and Riqqa as its Syrian capital, not to forget about uh, Libya, where it holds territory. Losing, gaining, flux, that's irrelevant. The fact is that they've held territory for more than two years and beyond that. Now, if that's the case, what the professional, and I ask you this question to think amongst yourself, can they actually have it both ways? Can they be territorialized in this, what I call here, Sirac, in the AFPAC uh, wordplay? Or can they fundamentally focus on the transnationalism regionally? Libya targeted, Tunisia targeted, Saudi Arabia, of course, uh, Jordan and Turkey, uh, all of the regions, parts of Africa, all over, and obviously the European uh, and uh, American operations. Which one should be, can be the priority? Can they have both? This is the territory they've held. This is the territory as it evolves. This is the territory as it keeps shrinking, but still with some bastions held fundamentally. The real thing at the end of this, regardless of your response, is the emphasis on the novelty. Rise of, rise of, rise of, rise of. This is the novelty. We're in the face of something that is emerging because of transnationalism. I submit to you, here, 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 even here, and of course the response to that transnationalism has been what? Extraterritoriality. It's very interesting. The symmetrical, grammatical in IR matters is the projection of war extraterritorially by one country here, but increasingly by others as a measure of a response. And the other response has been, quite paradoxically, fortification, the building of walls to keep at bay long walls in the desert in parts of the world to maintain that. So this is essentially the questions that transnationality has given us, that Al-Qaeda has demoed, and that the Islamic State has, in effect, perfected. Let me end by highlighting some of the challenging responses that we have to deal with operationally. Now, very straightforwardly, this is the most difficult proposition there exists today. This, if you recall, was the issue as it emerged. But yet today, as we can see, it gets more complex. Stateless, and yet the Islamic State is state building. Global, but you also have this local dimension, AFPAC, that I was discussing. Deterritorialized, evanescent in the Sahel, elsewhere, but re-territorialized in parts of the Levant and even North Africa with Libya. Untraceable in the open, the videos that you see. Solidarity and competition today with Al-Qaeda or the remnants of it. And so fundamentally, we have to understand that transnational conflict, terrorism itself, is fundamentally challenging because of its ability to transcend borders. This is the very first difficulty. Borders don't exist anymore. They're nominal. States might, organizations might want to codify them, insist on them, but whether we're looking at environment, migration, terrorism, you name it, the globalization that we inhabit today has transformed the world and therefore borders at best have been weakened, if not, as I said, no longer existent. Because of the inexpensive nature of an operation, because of its 
abstract nature because of its the, the, the very nature essentially of an online khalifat, if you think about it, is speaking to those terms. The groups can self-preserve, can navigate the territories, the cyber territories more easily. They have more tactical opportunities than ever. Unless you police any mall around the world or any place, you essentially are giving them a lot of possibility of flexibility. They're giving themselves. And they also don't even have to have a leader on that. Bin Laden dies, the Islamic, everybody hails that the Qaeda is finished, all of the experts got it wrong. The very next day, Islamic State is an even more powerful entity than AQ itself ever dreamed of being. And the next generation might be so diffuse, so inspired, what I call open source Al-Qaeda, that you could have a hard time even making sense of that. The loosening of spatial constraints and therefore the reduced chances of detection. Three things make that even more difficult. Technology constantly empowering. For the good, for the technology, for medical use, for people's contact, but also to be used as we've seen in the historical projection of violence since the age of dynamite in uh, the 1860s as such. Many countries here are transitioning, which means a weakening of the state, a moment where the state is weak as it reestablished itself. Look at Tunisia, relatively successfully politically in terms of its transition, but discovering the hazards of terrorism as such. And of course, every group's imitating the others, the mimetism. Boko Haram pledging allegiance to the Islamic State with all of that distance and differences, and even religion is not enough to explain that. And so you have real difficulties in addressing that. The answer, well, the most important thing is to keep a sense of proportionality. Um, General Lefebvre famously said to Napoleon that partisans have to be fought in partisan style. And yet, that is the only conflict that Napoleon lost, besides, of course, the last series of battles, which was, of course, in the guerrillas, as they call it, in Spain, dealing with the partisans. The asymmetrical nature of that as a demo was already an indication that if you go and over-militarize, as we've seen, you essentially are helping, in a way, that situation militarize. And it's a nightmare for the military, who cannot handle that type of civilian confusion. Which response do you choose of? How to be not too strong, not too weak? Some things have to be seen by the public, to be reassured, to be feeling that things are being done. Some work has to be underground, intelligence work, if it's going to be efficient. And every step of the way, is this working or not? And fundamentally, we get to a sense that, as I said earlier, do you need to align this with the essentials of human rights and uh, habeas corpus and due process? And unless one is fundamentally fatalistic about that and doesn't want to address it, then you open the door to violations, which can come back to haunt a very counter-terrorist activity. And so, essentially, you get a sense of difficulty. Lining up for simple but wrong answers is easy. Dealing with complexity is much more challenging. And you might find yourself alone for a while until it actually produces results and people rally around and understand. But it is a matter of leadership. It is a matter of choice. And each one of you will decide what they want, their government, their ministries, their uh, officers, um, their societies. But it is important to understand that what terrorism is raising are much la larger and complex issues as such. And so ultimately, a dilemma, as we can term it, fundamentally is based on this question of balance, balance, balance. States will not enter in any negotiation. It is uh, anathema to them because it gives legitimacy to the groups. The responses to be led by the military or the police or any special forces are complex, long, giving difficulty, dif results with quite a difficulty. While the pre public pressures for results immediately, you need to do this with calm and determination and a sense of responsibility. And every step of the way, as I said earlier, is this working. So a certain level-headedness is needed and, and cold-headedness as such. And that comes with an emphasis on balance between values, between goals, and between the efficiency that is expected. And so as we wrap up, colleagues, essentially I submit to you that we have left this old strategic paradigm, which is what it was, which was essentially a state-owned, state-defined, state-centered type of matrix that we used to have, out of which the current generation of non-state actors, of transnational actors, have escaped, generating systemic changes and all manners of issues in the middle, we dealt with one of them, 
in this module, transnational terrorism, but there are others, cyber warfare, and so on. These emerging challenges are moving us as practitioners towards a new, the box in dotted lines, reality, which has to do with the globalization of this, the global actors, the global actions. And to make sense of that, I think it's very important to improve our knowledge for more effective rules of protections, protection, and this is what we try to do in this hour. So, wrapping up, a few bullet points for you, keeping in mind that what we've seen earlier is the concept deficit of terrorism, which suffers a definitional problem, but that's not simply an impediment. We need to transcend that and go towards understanding the current context, which is qualified by the transnational nature of it, which features these new generation empowered and self-empowered actors whose very modus operandi I submitted to you is the mainstay of the transformation. It raises questions for you as practitioners to see what threat assessment is, what ethical obligations I highlighted that has to be maintained, and what type of acceptable or simply realistic resolution scenarios are. These are the larger questions. In terms of the smaller questions of what AQ and IS brought, they are both very militarized. They're born in conflicts, Afghanistan in the 1980s for AQ, Syria and Iraq in the 2000s and 2010s for IS. They are both actively transforming our understanding of terrorism as we've seen. They're both active, globalized, transnationalized as we've seen in the early days of bin Laden all the way to the group that he led to. And today, where is this moving? Is it at a strategic end? Are we rebooting what we have seen earlier? A question for each one of you to answer. Fundamentally, it is the long-term impact of what we have witnessed which is at the heart of this. And I think this is why making sense of transnational terrorism in this global perspective is important. Well, this is it. I hope this was of interest to you. I hope it will help you in um, moving forward with your understanding, your conceptualization and practice of these issues. And, and I wish you the very best. Thank you for your attention.